Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is easily one of India's most well-known and distinguished lawyers who combines legal acumen with a dramatic, heartfelt humanism. I'm delighted to welcome Mr. Fali Nariman. Okay. Mr. Nariman, you're frequently in the news, but most recently and, and perhaps significantly uh, in, in, a, in a profound, more enduring sense, you've been in the news with the bill that you introduced in Parliament, uh, seeking to make the judiciary more accountable and, and not just the sort of, you know, the holy cow that you have to keep a distance and, and on a pedestal and, and treat with sacred reverence. From the three organs of state that we have, I thought that over years, although the judiciary has been proactive, has been very liberal as well, uh, there has been a somewhat a reluctance in this organ of government uh, not to be as transparent as the other organs are made to be, the legislature and the executive. And I thought that it's perhaps time that uh, we should permit uh, a sort of a look-in by responsible people to see whether how this system works. There's a lot of complaint about the legal system. How does it work? How many cases get decided in courts? Which courts? Do the judges sit in time? How, how long do they take? And why do they take so long? And things of that sort. So what exactly does, does, does the bill <laughs> well, The bill is not, a very, uh, is not very ambitious. But at the same time, it provides by, that by way of law, the, the, there should be a statistical analysis or they should, should enable people to have a statistical analysis of various facets of how the law works and how the justice system works. But you know with six crore plus uh, cases pending, uh, do you really feel that the ju judiciary might be welcoming or, or open to this because it implicitly uh, is, is, is far greater in its intent than what seems apparent. It's not just for research because it will make the judiciary accountable. Apparently, a couple of high courts had refused to give statistics when called for by the law ministry saying that you are trenching on our independence. I don't think this trenches on any judicial independence. You see, we are, we are stretching these things too far. Transparency, when you, when you have transparency, that doesn't mean that you are yielding something by way of independence. On the contrary. You are making people accountable. Judges have to be accountable. So how real is the possibility that this bill might um, You see, the real? private member, I'm a private member. Correct. So a private <laughs> member's bill, uh, in the sense that it only evokes a discussion. And if the government thinks that it's something worthwhile taking up, then it gives an assurance that they will introduce it in the next session or in the, in the, the next sitting of the, of the House. And then on that assurance, the private member withdraws the bill. Because we have no right to legislate. Uh, the, gov the business of parliament generally is, the bus is government business. Uh, watching and, and, and being a part of the, the parliamentary process, the sort of the great pinnacle of Indian democracy, how disillusioning has it been or has it been validating for you? No, I don't think it's disillusioning. I mean, that, that's a, a conception which I, I did have at one time have. It's true there is a lot of shouting and somebody wants something or the other done instantly and would not let the proceedings go on, about which we are very upset because there are no proper rules by which we, we can go and should go, but that happens in all parliaments. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it's the microcosm of the nation, I mean, this, this uh, parliamentary system. And it's no use saying that I am an intellectual and I sort of have uh, very important ideas which others don't. On the contrary, I think in my stint of four and a half years or so, in the Rajya Sabha, I've, I've learned much more than what others have learned from me. You know, you have been sort of involved with so many sort of profound issues of interpreting the Indian constitution and the aspects of it. And this was an opportunity, in a sense, to see its workings. So what lessons have you drawn from it? And what ways do you have your perceptions maybe changed on how you would look at some of these larger issues? Well, one thing that has, uh, I have uh, uh, certainly been have learnt in uh, during the course of uh, this these sessions in Parliament is that perhaps if there is one drawback in our constitution which the founding fathers didn't foresee it was that we did not make part four of the constitution the directive principles of state state policy which are really the core of the constitution so could you explain that you see that says that we must have uh, meaningful education that there must be more social services, that the health of the people must be looked after. These are all concepts. They are not laws as such. They are concepts. 
Now, although laws are enacted pursuant to those concepts, those concepts themselves are not amenable to judicial review because there is a special exclusion clause. But I begin to think after seeing the judiciary function in the last 20 years, when the judiciary tells you what uh, fuel to put into your car and how to conduct, uh, what crops to grow at, at which part of the, uh, in which part of the country and things of that sort, with that sort of judicial activism, if the founding fathers have thought of that, they would certainly have made it enforceable in courts of law. And I don't think why they should not be. You have uh, you know, often remarked uh, that uh, it is really the individuals uh, who hold particular offices uh, that make the difference. Uh, rather than what you can ascribe to the office or, or, or the constitution or the law can provide. And I think this was particularly in the case of uh, reference to governors and I think sort of past presidents uh, here. Given that context and, and looking at the, the, the empowering of the individual, uh, how have you responded to the changes uh, suggested by the constitution uh, review? Uh, because you have also said that you have, you're not entirely for significant changes no, uh, to I'm the not. Constitution. You see, the, uh, one of the main reasons is that uh, it, 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 we will not be able to get it through. Just imagine, you see, the Constitution took two and a half years to draft. It was done by a constituent assembly which was not really set out to draft a constitution. It was only a legislative body which was converted into a constituent assembly. But nonetheless, these people who were there were so inspired. If you read these 13 volumes, you find that in almost every case, every clause of the Constitution, after two and a half years, there was not a single division in the lobby, not a single demand for a division. And that is what was mentioned by the President of the Constituent Assembly, Rajendra Prasad, at the end of the session. And, and that was the cohesion with which we did it. We have lost that touch. We have lost that idealism. That's what uh, worries me. As a citizen of India and, and an eminent one, uh, where do you see the catalyst for change coming? If, you know, we have lost these elements. Uh, how is it going to come about? I find uh, great hope in all the younger people. They, they are extraordinarily motivated. They want to do something. They are, they are, you see, uh, as you remember, this father of the European Union always said that uh, Jean Monnet, that there are two types of people, those who want to be somebody and those who want to do something. And now we have to have, there are too many people who want to be somebody. <laughs> we must have more, more doers in our country. And in every walk of life, it's not that you have to be prime minister in order to do something. In any significant walk of life, if you happen to do the right thing, I think, for instance, a teacher is a very important person. Uh, we remember our professors, as you know, with, with great feeling and affection and uh, regard, be just because they, they inspired in us a certain ideal. You're watching a conversation with Mr. Fali Nariman. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, to what degree do you think, Mr. Nariman, that, that this process of uh, social change that we're talking about can be nudged along, can be helped along by the judiciary? You refer to judicial activism. Uh, with both sort of, I think, uh, with, with, with a work p positive aspiration. Uh, how do you think that might sort of play itself out? Fortunately, the interpretation of the Constitution is left to the Supreme Court. It's the final interpreter of the Constitution, which is just as well. The Supreme Court has taken it upon itself to say that we cannot have any amendments to the Constitution which violate the basic structure, so that they've preserved the basic mm -hmm. structure. No, no one can take it away. No, no ruling party Correct. with a two-thirds majority mm -hmm. can, uh, can mm -hmm. grab the constitution and mm -hmm. take hold of it. Mm -hmm. So the court has, in that sense, uh, mm -hmm. made its point. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it realizes its mission. And uh, we somehow require mm -hmm. not more judges, but more competent judges, more judges with vision. And uh, in that sense, I think the Chief Justices in the past have set up a judicial academy in Bhopal recently mm -hmm. where judges also have to do their bit by way of learning because, I mean, we all learn mm -hmm. constantly. Mm -hmm. my, my senior in Bombay, Sir Jamshedji Kanga, at 90 said that we are still learning the law. Mm -hmm. And I wish more and more lawyers and judges realize that mm -hmm. we are still learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it's, not a, it's not an end process that I've finished and I've, mm -hmm. I'm now on top and I know everything about the law. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know so little about what there is to be known. And the more you learn, the more ideas you get, and the, the more I think we are able, better able 
to, mm. to interpret the constitution, interpret the law and do something at least for the society which, and this is where we have this problem of uh, legal aid, the poor not getting access to justice. And uh, that's a very, very common complaint. Mm -hmm. Easy access to justice by the poor is almost impossible in our country, despite all that we have done mm -hmm. in the past so many years. And mm -hmm. I feel that this requires a visionary, mm -hmm. some vision amongst judges. You know, beyond the, the, you know, the systems and processes and structures changing that, and going back to this question of, uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of individuals who can, who can make a difference, uh, are you despairing at, 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 at the status and the state of the, the, the judiciary and, and, and the lawyers and the legal system, in fact? Uh, not just sort of at the, at the apex of the pyramid, but the base is, is, is pretty shoddy. Oh, very shoddy. Oh, absolutely. I'm very ashamed of, the, of, the, of, of lawyers, particularly I am very ashamed. We have no right to go on strike. I mean, who asks us to go on strike? But we say that, the Supreme Court says that in judgments, but yet lawyers go on strike. And you go on strike on the slightest issue, on whether a bench should be formed at one particular place or not be formed at another particular place, which is entirely a matter for the government and the judiciary ultimately to decide because the, the people do want access to justice, which means access to courts as well, access to high courts. In fact, I am of the view that there should be more uh, benches of high courts, even of the Supreme Court, in, for instance, in Eastern India, which is totally left out of our entire line of thinking. And they feel very left out as well. And I don't see why we cannot have. And I've, I'm, I'm very much in favor of a bench of the Supreme Court. They may even sit for two days in a month or in two months. But nonetheless, the very presence of a judge of the Supreme Court makes a lot of difference. You've been associated with sort of uh, an endless number of some of the most significant cases, uh, uh, you know, the Gokulnath case, the Shivananda the Bharti case, the uh, Bhopal, uh, Narmada, and what have you. What has been sort of for you the most intellectually challenging and taxing? Case, single case. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I'm not quite sure. But uh, I find every case very challenging. Every case of importance. I mean, not, not the regular run of case. Because for the simple reason that it's a very, it's, a, it's, a, it's an intellectual treat in the sense that uh, you look up something, there's no, there's no, it's a, it's a, it's a, you think that the case is open and shut, but somehow it's not open and shut because of certain things that, that happen. And uh, that's, that's one of the great problems of the law, and that's why the law's delays also. People don't understand that, because it's a very, very difficult process. And we have a three-tier system, so that the, 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 the case passes from one court to another court and to a third court. And the largest possible litigant in our country is the state. 60% of litigant litigation is state litig litigation. And why they don't get settled is only because the, the, the state is always afraid of being uh, told that, well, you, you have uh, done this for ulterior motive. Mm -hmm. to, to what degree are you able to balance, uh, say, sort of uh, law and justice? That, uh, you know, is, is, is the unfolding of the law always just? It rarely, it not is and always so. So what does, what does a lawyer do in a, in a predicament like that? What does a lawyer do? Well, a lawyer has to argue his case. I agree that uh, there is no way, because he, especially in a case where there is the other side, because there is a lawyer on the other side. And it's for the judge, I think, who holds the scales, as it were. It's for the judge who's, who has to, to smell the injustice somewhere, you know? I mean, judges are trained like that. I mean, uh, uh, you know, the Burke's famous quotation that uh, there was, you can augur misgovernment at a distance and, uh, and smell the approach of tyranny. Uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's very important. You must be able to smell the approach of tyranny whenever, it's, uh, whenever things are getting bad. I mean, there, was, there must be that instinctive reaction of a judge to say that, no, no, this can't be done. Let me see how this can be done. And, and that's a very inspiring thing. Uh, uh, this, you know, the smell of tyranny, I, yeah, I think yeah. that... Uh, uh, when you were looking at the, the, the Bhopal case and, and, and appearing on behalf of Union Carbide, uh, you know, the public perception was that you know, maybe you went along there with the smell of tyranny. Looking back again, because this was so many 25 years ago, that uh, I might not have taken the case because I didn't realize how evocative is a mass tort case, how evocative, how emotional a mass tort case is. It's not about law. It's, a, it's an emotive thing. When so many people are dead or so many people are injured, it's not uh, what the law is. And you find that now, I mean, I'm wiser because I know much more about it, much more about things, I mean, in general, that in a mass tort case, we have not learned how to handle it. 
Nobody in the world has learned how to handle it. They've tried in America as well, but they've not succeeded. Even with their legislation, they have not succeeded. And therefore, perhaps it's, it's, it's one of those uh, pieces of things which where the, the public perception of the case precedes the actual decision in the case. It often happens. It often happens. And I don't blame the public mm -hmm. also for that. How serious a problem is that? You know, even as we record this, uh, there's been a, a case in Delhi currently of uh, two gay people who have been murdered. And uh, there's already a, a trial in the media. A trial in the media, yeah. So yeah. how is the balance? The balance is very difficult. We and I, I would never like to take away the right of the media to to comment on anything that's happening in the country. Because once you start start this regulation, uh, you you then get all all manner of uh, obnoxious legislation. But the the question is, how do we control it? For instance, we we had we saw also on television a. Uh, a confession by a, to a, by a gentleman of, uh, of, uh, of having murdered a particular person. Which has uh, now been retracted. Which has not been, uh, yeah, now been retracted. I mean, these, these are things which uh, do alarm me. And perhaps that's a, a ma matter which the press council can perhaps uh, look at and consider. They can only be done by gentle persuasion. It can't be done, I think, by law. The law doesn't help at all. Well, we have a sort of a, a, a lawyer of your stature on the program. What happens when someone retracts a confession he's made in front of television, in front of millions of people? Well, that's, that's no possible? confession at all. Mm -hmm. you see, that, that's the problem. In fact, uh, I mean, this, this sort of thing ought not to have been entertained by the media, in my humble opinion, for the simple reason that uh, when you say something in, in public, that's, that's not exactly what uh, the, the confessional statement is required. It requires, a, there's a certain procedure. You have to follow that procedure. It has to be before a magistrate. The magistrate has to record it. You have to sign it, etc., etc. The mere fact that so many thousands of people see it by itself uh, may have, again, public perception. But fortunately, we don't have trials by jury. So the jury is not likely to be influenced. But uh, in the particular case you mentioned, the gentleman has to be extradited. And where in, a, in a country where they do have juries, and, and that's likely to cause some uh, ripples. Uh, you know, you come from a, from a minority community yourself, and, yes. and in a sense, uh, you know, the, the numbers are shrinking. Uh, how, how, how threatened do you feel? Uh, no, as, I don't feel threatened. <laughs> no, I don't feel threatened. I think that we have, our numbers, our dwindling numbers are our safety. <laughs> if we were many more, perhaps we, and, and for one thing, we are, we are, we are uh, uh, though a proselytizing religion in the past, we are no longer a proselytizing religion. In fact, uh, we, uh, we believe that, uh, 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 like you say, that we believe that uh, the space in heaven is crammed, <laughs> and only good Parsi Zoroastrians will, <laughs> can endeavor to get in. <laughs> There has been, in, in, in recent times, this sort of ongoing debate on the nature of Indian secularism and how it ought to look uh, at, at, at the minorities. Uh, and in, 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 the, in, in the constitutional context, how would you prefer, how would you like to see Indian secularism defined? I would like to see it defined as Nehru defined it. I would like to see a pluralist society. Because for the simple reason that India doesn't belong to the Hindus or to the Muslims or to the Sikhs or to the Parsis or to anybody else. And India belongs to, to a whole set of people who have come from all parts of the world, who have, after they have come here and settled down for centuries, have become distinctly Indian. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the great, uh, the great contribution, I think, of this country. Mm -hmm. it, it's something which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is why I've been telling one minister after another who's, uh, who's there in charge of education, that instead of quarreling about who writes history textbooks, Please prescribe the discovery of India by Pandichi, mm -hmm. because it was one of the most inspiring textbooks that we read when we were in college, as mm -hmm. you remember. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. a fantastic. Uh, we, we learn everything about ancient India, medieval India, and modern India, mm -hmm. all in one and very neatly done, and, mm -hmm. and from a really secular point of view. You're watching the conversation with the eminent lawyer, Mr. Fali Nariman. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. <laughs> Welcome back to a continuing conversation with Fali Nariman. Mr. Nariman, have you ever thought that you might have been uh, a judge or, 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 or preferred to be a judge? Has that ever come up for you? Yeah, it has come up several times. But uh, at one time when salaries were low and I couldn't afford it, I'm a refugee, you see, from Burma. <laughs> and uh, my parents couldn't, uh, we had to support various people in our family and so on. Mm. And uh, I, I declined. I was offered a judgeship at, when I was 38, which was very early. Far too early, they say, but anyway, I was uh, of the High Court, but then I had to decline. And after that, uh, I was also asked 
a judge of the Supreme Court, but then again I declined. Uh, perhaps in retrospect, uh, maybe wrong or maybe right, but I think I, I can make a bit greater contribution as a, a lawyer and now fortunately as, a, as someone having some say <laughs> in, in the assemblies that, of, of people that I, I possibly, I, I think I am I'm a little better off. Than what do you think are the, are the gratifications of being a judge? But the major, major gratification I think of being a judge is to, to, to ultimately see that no injustice is done. I think that is perhaps, if I were a judge, I, I would feel extraordinarily upset if I later found, as, as sometimes it ha so happens, that a particular case is decided totally wrongly. But, uh, and uh, that, that would give me qualms. But the great gratification, I think, is that you, you, you set a course for the law, you set a course of interpretation of the Constitution, especially if you are in the highest court. And that's, I think, a great uh, thing that you can do. You, you, can, you can set the course for, for many, many years. And the better judgment you write, the more it is read, mm -hmm. the more people read it, the more evocative it is. Mm -hmm. So do you ever regret it? Might that have not been too constricting a context to be a judge? I, I don't know. I regret nothing. I mean, I take <laughs> life as it comes along because uh, uh -huh. it's very difficult to plan things. And fortunately, we don't know what's, what's in store for us uh -huh. uh, over the years. And I think that's a very good... I never go to astrologers. I never ask my future. Uh -huh. So I'm not bothered. I mean, you have to take things as they come and that's... Uh, uh -huh. The way of life. I mean, whether it, it goes up or it go, comes down, it's a matter of uh, uh -huh. how how you take things. Where would you like to see your your, your life go to now at this stage, where you're at the apex of your uh, I don't profession. know about apex. I don't know about <laughs> apex. Not at my age, but at any rate, uh, I suppose uh, the satisfaction of seeing that if you can uh, can have uh, can have done something uh, useful, something worthwhile, then perhaps. Uh, but you see, individuals, I don't think, can, can, can make much difference in a, in a scheme of things which is a, the sort of politics we have today, the sort of governance we have today. You have to have people who are extraordinarily prominent in the political sphere who become leaders and guide the country. Unfortunately, and this is my great regret, we don't have people like Mahatma Gandhi to whom even leaders could go to and say, now what shall we do? There is this problem. What shall we do? And I mean, he, in his old wisdom, would say something. We don't have the wise old men, unfortunately. Why do I get the sense of, uh, you know, sort of despair? You talked about hope uh, in, in, in the early part of this conversation, but, but yet you seem to, there seems to be an air of, of, of despair and, and despondency. We don't have the leadership. We don't have a Gandhi. Uh, you know, values are, are, are decaying. Do we just sort of sit back and wait for life to unfold? And then you also are despairing that, uh, that individuals, you say, can't make a difference. Yes, individuals also, I don't think, can make a difference. They can only make a noise. They can, make, they can, they can, they can shake things up a little, but uh, not, not uh, to the extent you, you, you desire. But uh, there, there is something wrong, I think, in the entire democratic system of our country. And I, I believe that the only safeguard we have is democracy. We can't do away with it at our, we do away with it at our peril because if you see any, everywhere around us, I mean, mm -hmm. things are not better with dictatorships, definitely not. Mm -hmm. So that uh, we have this problem of uh, which is the best form of government. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you remember, Malcolm Margaret mm -hmm. said, the best mm -hmm. form of government is a dictatorship provided mm -hmm. dictatorship tempered with assassination. <laughs> <laughs> so that you are, you are compelled to get rid of the dictator at the end of the first year because he's First year in office is always the best, uh -huh, uh -huh. but unfortunately we can't afford to take that risk. We uh -huh. have to get along uh -huh. with the way we are, shuffling along, I'm afraid, uh -huh. and uh, uh -huh. hope for, hoping, as you uh -huh. say, uh -huh. hoping, hoping for the best. <laughs> we, we know we discuss secularism, we discuss the minority community, uh, uh, you're a Parsi. Uh, to, to what degree is your faith uh, important uh, to you in, in, in your oh, everyday extraordinarily life? Important, extraordinarily important. I believe that, uh, uh -huh. that unless you have your communication channels with the Almighty, uh -huh. uh, you are a lost soul, uh -huh. totally lost soul. That's my personal belief. Uh -huh. And the uh -huh. older I grow, the more I believe that. Uh -huh. I think, you know, very often we, we tend to find uh, sometimes a, a conflict in, you know, in, in, in Hindu language, we, in, 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 in the vocabulary of Hinduism, we described it as samsara, uh, you know, between samsara and dharma, uh, and, and, and you're a lawyer. Uh, do you find that conflict come up for you sometimes? 
between your obligations as a lawyer and, and, and your spiritual um, moorings, inclinations? No, I think they, at the beginning perhaps yes, when, when you are anxious to get some work and do something, etc., when you make some effort at being recognized. Mm -hmm. But I think now we have reached a stage where mm -hmm. uh, for the last few years, fortunately I am not bound to do everything that I am asked to do. I mean, and, and I can certainly pick and choose. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, deal with things uh, on my own and I, therefore I don't find too much of that conflict. Mm -hmm. And besides, you see, the, the common impression that a, that a lawyer has to tell lies in court in order to get his client off or to win his case mm -hmm. is not quite the, the correct thing. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are, there are problems with uh, lawyers and uh, with, uh, but, uh, the, and I always tell my lawyer friends mm -hmm. that perhaps during the strikes that lawyers have, <laughs> the judges come across and are able to communicate with clients directly and find that they are able to dispose of the case far more easily uh -huh. with the client than with the, with the lawyer interceding. Uh -huh. And that often happens where there is an impediment, the lawyer becomes some sort of an impediment. Uh -huh. And I think that uh, we lawyers have to now uh, gear ourselves in this new society to be not an impediment to justice but to be uh -huh. a promoter of justice. Uh, you're a well-known, well-recognizable lawyer and it's unlikely that if you were introduced to someone at a party they wouldn't know you. But should that happen, how would you introduce yourself? Oh, I, I say I'm, I'm uh, Batsi Nariman's husband. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Nariman, thank you very much. That's been a great pleasure. Thank you, sir. <laughs> In Conversation was brought to you by Dabar Lal Toothpaste. Long Pudina Tomar, Taklifein Rakhye Dur.